Welcome to the show, Miriam. We are so excited to have you on. Now, to get things started, what are you doing to nourish yourself right now? I would say my, my newest strategy in the morning, typically when I get up, is to do some sun salutations. Mm -hmm. And I basically, it gives me a full body stretch, it clears my mind, uh, be, opens up the body, loosens things up, because I know I'm going to be sitting a lot of the day. And I would say that's kind of my, my current strategy right now. About five minutes I do, five to ten minutes, and gets my heart pumping too. <laughs> that is such a good good thing to do. I was telling my climbing partner this morning, kind of joking, but kind of not. I was like, oh, I haven't done yoga since like 2008, but not totally joking, so I definitely need to get back into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I chose sun salutations, because they're short. Yeah. And I give myself, if I can do for 10 minutes, I do it. If I can't, if I can get just two of them in, I do too. So I don't put any pressure because that's, you know, now you have pressure to do yoga, which is like the exact opposite of what you want to be doing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, Miriam, do you have like a special spot in your house that you do yoga or do you go outside? Um, well, outside in Tucson means you're going to step on needles or rocks or scorpions or something really bad. So... <laughs> I avoid anything that where I might need to lay on the ground in the desert here, but we do have a room in our home um, that is dedicated to all things exercise, stretching, yoga, meditation, whatever. So. Oh, nice. I love it. I yeah. love that. Yeah, me too. Do you have any other cool little tidbits that are in that room that make it special? Um. Well, we got a lot of equipment in there. Um, my husband's a personal trainer and an a Ironman triathlete. So we have all kinds of little gizmos for stretching, uh, pounding muscles, rolling on foam rollers, slant boards to stretch the, the, the calves, um, and a bolster to uh, put, put feet up. We're learning really uh, some pretty interesting stuff about mm -hmm. functional movement. And just putting your feet up sort of in a, like a, like this on top of a bolster, just laying there for three to 10 minutes and it completely aligns a lot of the out of alignment stuff we do when we're sleeping at night. So all kinds of, we got all kinds of stuff in this house <laughs> for fitness and, and exercise. That's awesome. So my husband and I are both triathletes. He did an oh. Ironman. I've only done a half. Oh. But it was funny because when we moved in together, we realized that we had like no fewer than 20 foam rollers between <laughs> the two of us and like all of the gadgets. It was quite ridiculous. <laughs> so how many bikes do you have? That's the question. You know, we only, we're down to two okay. because both of us cracked our frames on our time trial bikes. Oh my so we're, we're only down to two bikes oh, now, wow. but we've picked up snowboarding and rock climbing in the meantime. Oh, so, that'll fill the space. <laughs> yeah, plenty of gear. <laughs> oh, that's um, great. Great to that's hear. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miriam, we are so excited to have you on the show today. And um, we're thrilled to talk about your book, The Peace Process. So this is a book that we had, it was required reading in the Nutritional Therapy Association uh, program. And Casey and I just absolutely loved your book. I know we were just telling you that. Mm -hmm. And so we're super excited just to talk about starting up and growing a holistic nutrition business today. But first, we want to learn just a little bit more about what your story is and what brought you to this industry. Mm. And I talk a lot about it in the peace process uh, book, of course. Um, but of course, not everybody has read that book. So I'll repeat it for the audience. Um, I was working in corporate America, I've been working there most of my life, um, and, you know, typical, typical kind of grind. I was working at Microsoft Corporation, actually, uh, as a senior sales and marketing executive there. And um, nearing the end of my time at that company, um, my brother got very, very ill and um, went into the hospital for uh, heart surgery. They said that he, he was having some chest pains, he had some blockage, and they were going to do bypass surgery on him. Now, he was only about 43 at the time, <clears throat> so kind of unusual. But when he went in for the surgery, um, a mistake was made. And th at the time, and we still see this today, surgeons are performing back-to-back -back bypass surgeries. They're kind of like a factory. And 
Uh, my brother happened to be at the tail end of the factory line that day. The surgeon got tired and left the room while um, getting ready to do the closing uh, following the surgery. And during that close, which he relegated to an intern, they connected a vein to an artery in my brother's heart. Uh, that's not a good thing. And my brother went into immediate cardiac arrest uh, and nearly died on the operating table. Uh, they were able to save him, but he lost about 80% of his heart function and was going to need a new heart to survive. Well, in the ensuing months, and that was devastating enough, but in the, the ensuing a couple of years following that, my brother had a series of other maladies. And I'm still working at Microsoft at the time, trying to run back to see how he was doing. He came down with hepatitis and a hole in his esophagus. And he had bout after bout of pneumonia and all kinds of horrible, strange problems. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And he was pretty much bedridden from the failed heart surgery. Well, finally, about a month before his passing, and it was three months after his heart surgery, um, he was admitted to the hospital with what turned out to be an inoperable brain tumor. And while they were running tests, blood work and other labs prior to attempting to remove the brain tumor, they discovered he had full-blown AIDS. What they discovered was during the heart surgery a few years prior, not only did they mess up the closing and destroyed his heart, but they also had given him seven units of blood, four of which were tainted with HIV. So he passed. Uh, my mother, who was a nurse, was the one discovered all of these errors. She had called for the operating room records. She slid into depression and died. Another brother of mine was in the military, had a break with reality over the loss, and was institutionalized. And shortly after that, my father died. Now, I was in my early 40s at the time, and I was absolutely livid that all of this destruction happened over what was originally my thought was these were medical errors, which they were. But then I took a closer look and I thought, you know, did my brother even have to go into the hospital in the beginning, right? He was only 43. So I began to explore how do you actually address these diseases with diet? Because I've always been a foodie. I've always, like everybody in this field, right? We've read every book on nutrition that came our way before we even pursued it as, as a course of study. Many of us somehow came to nutrition. Um, and I decided I was going to go back to school. I was going to quit my job at Microsoft, uh, left a lot of money on the table but I couldn't stand the thought of just going out and selling another box of software. I had to do something about this idea that was now ignited in my brain that diet could actually head off things like heart disease down the road. So I pursued my PhD in nutrition um, actually back in about 14, 15 years ago and started my practice with the goal of making sure that nobody ever had to go through what I went through and losing my entire family. Mm -hmm. I know that's so tragic. I'm so sorry to hear that, Miriam. Um, it's just so crazy how the standard of care and our medical community, like those mistakes happen every day to families and they just go brushed under the table, you know? Um, but it's really powerful because that's also what got you here, you know? And now- I know you're helping other families and you're saving other people's lives. And I mean, it's tragic, but I think that's kind of why we're all here. We have somewhat of a similar story. Um, maybe not to that extent, but especially, you know, health related in terms of our own health or our friends or family's health. And that's what got us here. Absolutely. It's a pretty common theme. And, um, you know, I, I, I teach a, a course for the NTA a business course and people tell their stories almost everyone has come here through either a personal health journey or losing a relative horrible stories. And you, you realize just how prevalent this is. Mm -hmm. It's wild. 
It's mm. wild. Well, I'm so excited that you're here today because I get so many questions all the time about like, how do I do what you're doing? You know, how do I become a nutritionist? How do I get into this field? Like, how did you even find, you know, the program to do and all of these questions? So I'm just so excited to, you know, touch a lot of people's lives with our show today. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, I mean, begin by uh, telling us about your book. I mean, the peace process, this really helped put the skeleton framework in place for Casey and I know to really start putting our uh, businesses together. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us a little just about, you know, why you wrote it, what problems does it solve? And then also describing each step. And I love how there's so many of those uh, analogies like peace, right? You've got, <laughs> they all have a different um, analogy for them. So yeah, talk to us about your book. Sure. So when I went into my own practice um, early on, I was doing pretty well, had a lot of success, and you know, primarily because my entire life prior to nutrition was as a sales and marketing um, executive. So I was totally comfortable with marketing my, my services. And what I discovered once I began my work were my new set of peers who were other nutritionists, chiropractors, uh, acupuncturists, integrative medical doctors, naturopathic physicians. I began my whole to view my whole new community, learning more about them. And what I discovered was they were terrified of sales and marketing. They never learned how to do this. Very few people who come into this have a strong sense of confidence around that. And what was most tragic of all was that they were closing their doors. They were losing their businesses because they, they were frightened. They lacked the confidence and the skills. So I thought, hmm, I've spent my entire life in sales and marketing, and I could spend the rest of my life helping people nutritionally as a nutrition consultant. Or I could codify my sales and marketing knowledge, everything I learned prior to my nutrition business, and then pull into it how I've adapted it in my business to be successful, why don't I codify it into a book and help all these people who are struggling because I want to create an army. Because as we just got done saying, I think it's about a quarter of a million people a year who are harmed by our, our conventional medical system right now. How are we going to address that if people are afraid to go out of business, if our nutrition community is terrified of opening up a practice? So I figured I am going to eliminate that barrier, or at least I'm going to put my effort toward eliminating that barrier, write a book and begin the, to get the word out on how you can make this happen for you. I made it happen. Many people um, that I taught, because I was doing a lot of coaching and teaching in colleges, but I'd never codified it into a book. And then I took my course that I was teaching and I put it into the book um, for that goal, to help people to create this army so real health can happen out there. Mm -hmm. So I codified it by looking at the steps that I had used and felt were essential because there were a few things that were just a little different about traditional sales and marketing that you use in a corporate environment versus what you might use as an entrepreneur, a newtrepreneur, as I called it. So PEACE became an acronym for five steps. And the, the first step, the P in PEACE, is for purpose because most marketing books really don't talk about like what's your purpose or they talk about it in terms of maybe your vision or your mission but they don't talk about it in terms of how does it power marketing but purpose is important because if you don't know why you're doing this work if you're not tethered to something that emotionally and spiritually, you know, every morning that you're waking up to, by God, get out there and do this work, even if I'm terrified, even if I don't know enough, whatever, that purpose drives you through that, what we used to call in technology, the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. When you really know what you are all about, those fears begin to look almost silly next to the mission that you have, right? Like, oh, I'm afraid to make that phone call. And you're going, really? Are you going to play that small? You have a bigger purpose. Go do that purpose. So the purpose aspect is the first part. Um, it helps because it's not only us that doubt ourselves. 
you know, I often ask the question when I teach a live class or I have a live speaking engagement, let's see a show of hands of people in your life who have no clue what you're doing and think you're crazy. And usually the whole room <laughs> raises their hand. You need to be able to convince them too that this is the right path. But if you're not certain about that, it's real easy to be pulled off course. So that's the, the P and why I feel it's so important to get that locked and loaded before you do anything with marketing. Mm -hmm. The second step, the E after in peace, um, is about establishing yourself. And that means finding your little niche, your area of the market that you can position yourself as an expert in. You know, a lot of people get frightened by that idea because they go, I'm not an expert yet. I'm brand new. How can I be an expert? Well, you become the expert by niching. Reason being, once you say, hey, I'm going to work with families who are trying to conceive. That's the population I really feel compelled to work with. When you do that, now all of a sudden you attract people who are in that situation you begin to read the books and the blogs and subscribe to the articles and other things that are all about just that one topic. You take special classes, maybe CEU courses in that topic. So when you begin to niche, you become the expert. Pretty soon you start writing about it and then you start talking about it. Well, if you're going to talk about it or write about it, you sure as well better know about it. So it forces a discipline to learn about it. And of course, day one, you're not the expert, but frankly, everybody knows more than the average person out there. The, the way we work holistically, especially from the NTA perspective, almost cleaning up anybody's diet is going to help improve their potential to get pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. In theory, unless there's something else really, you know, going on that we can't quite figure out. But, but the establishment allows you to Focus your efforts, simplify your work, become an expert, position yourself in a marketplace, um, and save you a whole lot of time, energy, and money. Because when we, we say, but the whole world needs my help, that's true. But when you decide to attract the whole world, you're going to spend all of your evenings and weekends learning about every single condition, all these supplements, all the potential diets, etc. Who has time for that? Nobody has time for that. So take your piece of the world, find peers who are working on other kinds of niches and become an amazing referral market. That's how, you know, the, the, the whole ship lifts on a rising tide. And that's how we do that by, by having that level of focus. And understand the other thing, a niche isn't a life sentence and it doesn't mean you can't work with anybody you want. It is a marketing strategy, okay? So a lot of people, I did some interviews such as this uh, a few years ago with an associate of mine. We did the Prosperous Practitioner Summit. And we interviewed big names like Tom O'Brien and, um, you know, Keisha Ewers and uh, all kinds of folks. And every single one of them started with a small niche and grew from there. They cautioned against bringing in other people, even though your marketing method is niching, because all of a sudden now, all of a sudden, you're going to have to spend your weekends and evenings learning about all these other people. So stay true to that niche and build from there. Get really good with this one market. It's better to get a bigger share of a tiny market than to do this pot shot, you know, maybe I can grab somebody by casting this massive net out there. That never works. Niching has been proven over and over in every industry since time began. Mm -hmm. Niching is the way to go. So I can't talk enough about niching in case you can't tell. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of it. <laughs> what I think where people are struggling and failing mm -hmm. is lack of focus. And it starts with a niche. Mm -hmm. totally the third agree. step is attract. That's the third step of the peace process. And attraction is finding ways to attract the people to you once you've niched. Because each of these steps build on the other. They're not isolated. So let's say I want to work with that um, market of individuals who are trying to conceive. Now, if I say, how do I attract those people? 
it becomes much more powerful than how do I find clients, right? How do I attract those people who are looking to get to conceive? Well, where do they hang out? Hmm, okay, I could probably look for support groups. There might be Facebook groups or uh, meetups. There could be all kinds of magazines or specialty events, uh, maybe a natural grocer's you might be able to do, or some other kind of local grocer, do a talk on that and be very, very focused. So when you have your niche in hand, you look for all the various ways you might reach into that population, then pick the one to two strategies, just one to two, back to simplification, like I'm going to speak and I'm just going to do networking. Those are my two things. Or I'm going to blog and I'm going to do group classes and you figure out ways to attract people that way. You pick what your one or two strategies that you feel good about and start hitting the pavement, doing those things over and over and over again and pretty soon the attraction begins to happen. The messages on your website will start to attract because you're gonna say, help with conception over and over and over again. You're gonna continually repeat that phrase in multiple ways which will begin to start that attraction referral engine that'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. Connect is the fourth step and connection is, um, my best example is this. 90 to 95% of the time person is looking for help. Where do they go to find it? Online. So if they go online and let's say they're looking for someone who can help them because they want to have a baby. Well, they stumble on your site because you've done an excellent job of attracting them with the right message, the right language. But they go, I'm interested in her, but I'm not quite ready to call her yet. Now what happens? Well, 90% of the time when people come to your website, they aren't going to take action. But there's still, some of those people are still interested in you. You need to collect their email address somehow collect their name, maybe it's in a talk, and begin the process of connecting with them. Connection means I'll send you a newsletter once a month or a, a new blog post that I put up. I'll invite you to my Facebook page and I'll begin the conversation. Now understand these aren't sales pitches, all of these touches. These are about demonstrating your expertise, your understanding of their issues, talk about possible solutions they might try. It's giving value, connecting, building what's called the know, like, and trust factor when it comes to marketing. So that when they are ready, the first person they're gonna think about is you, because you've stayed in touch and you've demonstrated that you know what they're dealing with and you can help them. So the connection is all about maintaining some communication with the myriad of prospects out there, which is way larger than the actual client base you have. Um, so that when it's time for them to take action, you're the first person that they think about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final step is the engage step. So the first four steps are all about marketing, setting yourself up in your business, establishing your market, attracting people with strong, powerful messages, engaging with them on a regular basis. Now they call you up and they go, okay, tell me about your services. The engage step is about closing the deal. It's about selling your services. And this is an important part of the, the peace process because that is often the place where people get really nervous and uncomfortable asking for money for their services. Um, and so in the engage step, I outline in the book, four stages of selling, um, which are foundational for any kind of sales. You know, um, it's called PACE, P-A-C-E. I left the E out of that, but I got really kind of stuck on all these P's and acronyms. <laughs> but um, it's being present, asking the right questions, um, digging deeper by clarifying with people why they feel now is the time, how will this help them, asking some really deep questions, and then enrolling them in the process. So um, there's a lot to each of those steps.
but that is the final step is taking all those people who are hanging out, listening to you, signing up for your newsletter, following you on social media. And now when they make that phone call or you reach out to them with a program or uh, maybe a special offer, turning those leads into actual paying clients. Mm -hmm. Those are the steps mm -hmm. of the peace process. Mm -hmm. And I, I love how you explained um, the niche aspect because it's so true. Once you get honed in and you become an expert, like let's say on fertility, right? It just leads you down the road to then you start looking into, okay, fertility, but what's going on with fertility? Oh, your gut? Like this could be related to the gut. And then it just, it lingers into other areas that you will eventually become an expert in. So don't get nervous about, oh man, I can't just do hormones. I can't just do fertility. I've got to really expand that will definitely come. It will come with you getting into fertility and hormones and it will lead into everything else that ties to that. That is brilliant. And, and that's exactly when folks get nervous, they go, wait a minute, I was trained to be holistic. I don't break the body apart and examine these pieces and parts. You know, that's that reductionist conventional medical model. I'm holistic. I look at the whole picture. Well, guess what? Just as you said, Megan, you're going to work holistically. You're going to look at the gut. You're going to look at the blood sugar. You're going to look at all of the, the environmental factors. You're still going to work holistically with that person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to a different end. So I'm so glad you brought that up. That mm -hmm. is the point of <laughs> one of yeah. the key points of, of the power of niching. Mm -hmm. Finding your niche in the beginning and just becoming an expert. Yeah. See where the journey leads you. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I feel like I was just listening to you read your book to me through <laughs> explaining the peace process. <laughs> I've done it a couple times. <laughs> I love it. So, Miriam, what do you think is the biggest difference between um, those who succeed and those who don't? Is it do your you niche? <laughs> well, it's related to that. Okay. Focus, focus, absolutely, and simplifying. Mm. Um, before... Um, one of my, my, I guess, primary areas of work for a little while was in one-to-one -one coaching of clinicians. I don't do that work anymore, but that was a big part of my work early on. And it was fascinating. And I, I see it now even in the career development course at NTA. People say, oh, okay, great. So here's my niche. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to blog. I'm going to go do Instagram and then I'm going to go do talks and I'm going to create this program. I'm going to do pantry clean outs. I'm going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay. Focus. That means one or two things. Mm. Um, you know, there was a quote in a movie I've never forgotten. It was something like, you know, we barely have time in life to be great at one thing. Why would we take on all of these things that we don't know how to do and try to be great at all of them? Mm -hmm. Because there's a concept that the more we do, the more people we bring in. Of course, that is the exact opposite of reality. We need to do one to two things exceptionally well, do them over and over and over, never let up on the gas pit pedal until next thing you know, you've got nothing but a referral business. And that is what happens for people who do that level of focus. So focus is my one, one big thing, focus and simplification. And that does include niching niching gives you the focus but then once you have the niche you need to simplify how you're going to reach that market and um because you'll spend your whole time doing a, a, a million different things marketing wise and get zero traction and then you say hey i'm doing everything possible how come i'm not i'm not having success it's mm -hmm. because you're doing everything possible okay mm -hmm. so i would say what i really see in those who succeed is that aspect of understanding Focus, start very, very small. Um, don't build too fast. Don't start to build all of these programs and things. Start to get traction financially and then build one other small thing and build from there. So focus and simplification um, is something that I really, really find to be the, one of the big differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome because especially in our industry, we get so overwhelmed. We feel like we have to do everything all at once as soon as we graduate. <laughs> We've got to make all the freebies and all the sugar detoxes and all the different <laughs> protocols and 
I'll, uh, <laughs> to, to that point, okay, how many people do you know, and people listening in on this, feel like they don't know enough when they leave their NTA program? Oh my gosh, I got to take XYZ's program, and I've got to know how to do the GAPS diet. I need to have to understand how to take Dr. Tom O'Brien's autoimmune stuff. And I got And it's like, before you know it, they feel they need more and more initials after their name, more and more classes. And actually, it's more confusing and complicated. Mm -hmm. You know enough. The NTA programs are well beyond adequate in terms of you being able to guide people. You'll know 10 times more than the average person just coming out of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, you'll know more than they can even absorb at this point. Because we don't want to throw the kitchen sink at these folks. They're struggling and suffering enough. We need to take it very slow with a lot of these folks. They've been abused by conventional medicine too long. We don't need to make it even more complicated for them. Mm -hmm. So to that point, I do see a lot of folks who, who leave their programs and feel they don't know enough. It's a big confidence factor. Mm -hmm. You know enough. Can't say this enough. You know enough. Mm -hmm. Even the NTA for myself, especially, I left the NTA and I was like, I feel like I just need to do that one more time because there's yeah. so much information in there. <laughs> I'm with you. I went through the program myself a couple years ago because I wanted a refresher. Mm -hmm. It had been over 10 years since my last program and things have changed. Things change every week in mm -hmm. this industry. Always. And I went, holy cow, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty. Yeah. Yeah. And then you start going through it and you're like, I really do. I know a lot. Like I, and then you start getting confident about the information that you do know and how we can really help people with what we learn. And you become more confident by doing, not by sitting and reading more books, not by taking another program, right? Everybody I know in the industry said, you know, when I learned, I learned when I actually started talking to clients mm -hmm. and I realized what I didn't know, that's what I went and studied. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Or when you first get out of your program and you're like, oh, I've got to get my website. I've got to get my Instagram. I've got to do all these things. It's like, don't worry about that stuff. Worry <laughs> about helping the people and getting your experience there. And all of these other things will come. Yeah, will all come. That is, yeah, my biggest advice too, is just get started. Don't worry about how pretty your website looks and all that kind of stuff. Just get started. It's called momentum. There one you go. One step. Yeah. Because people go, I don't know what to do next. You say, well, when you take one step, the next step will present itself. Mm -hmm. But you've got to take the first one. You can't sit all alone because I don't know about you guys. I work at home in, a ho in my own office. I'm in my head all day, mm -hmm. picking up all kinds of stories <laughs> like we all do. You, you got to take the step. You got to step outside the door and do something. And uh, a, an individual was just telling me um, that she, uh, she's focusing on dental health, um, nutrition, dental health, which I think is a brilliant niche. And she was talking to a woman in the grocery store line about, and the person said, you know, what do you do? And she used my, my niche, my niche pitch in my book. And she, she said, oh, I help people who, you know, are tired of all the cavities and want to know if there's a nutritional approach. And she went, Oh my God, here's my card. Give me a call. And she goes, wow, it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just start talking, just get mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And making that connection making that connection because whatever you're niching in, there are people out there that have those exact issues. I mean, that's obviously why you niche, right? You find, you find your community of people who need your help. Yeah. So if you're like, I'm a nutritionist, like, oh, well, that's great. Like you help people with their diet. But then you're like, I help people specifically with fertility. They're like, oh my gosh, I have a cousin or a, you know, exactly. 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 Yep. Now, what are some of the best ways to get started with marketing, especially when first starting out? Um, well, presumably, you've really figured out your niche market and who you want to focus on. And um, I mentioned these, these interviews that an associate and I had done a few years ago with uh, a lot of big name, um, holistic practitioners of all stripes. And every single one said, the fastest way to get new clients is through networking and talks. 
And I think there's a big, um, I believe, a, a misunderstanding out there that the fastest way to get clients is to build a Facebook page <laughs> and um, build programs. Well, no, well, who are you going to invite to your programs? You got to get out there and, and start finding some clients and prospects. And so um, networking, various ways to do that. They have more formal type of networking groups in most communities like BNI and there, there are others. Um, or uh, but here in Tucson where I live, we have uh, an integrative wellness coalition where we do our own kinds of networking and sort of lead sharing that sort of, that kind of activity. Hmm. Um, it, it could be as simple as once you know who your market is, who you want to focus on, is identifying potentially ally practitioners who also work with that same market and meeting up with them, taking them for lunch, um, bringing them some healthy snack and, and sitting down with them and talking about how you might be able to work together for referrals. But nothing beats in-person stuff in the beginning because when you're brand new and nobody knows who you are, you know as well as I do, when you can meet someone face to face, look in their eyes, hear their voice, you begin to build a lot more trust, confidence, and more willingness to refer. Um, so in-person activities and the two are public talks. Um, there's, I know plenty of fear around public talks, um, but once again, if you've got your niche figured out, um, then giving the talk, mostly addressing what it is they're interested in, is a, a beautiful way to, to get people to look at you and view you as an expert, um, and then the networking. So those to me are the absolutely fastest ways to get out there and start to uh, bring in some business. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I was at a networking event a couple of weeks ago, and one of the ladies there is, does like mortgage loans. And she said that she's a member, she's also a huge fan of the band Fish. And so she's in these Facebook groups for, you know, like fish fans and like fish junkies and that kind of thing. And she said that she has gotten, I think it was like 60 or 70% of her business from referrals wow. from these like fish groups. So it's just <laughs> wow. something, you know, like that she's really into and, you know, people would ask like, Hey, do you know, anybody know a mortgage person? And they would, you know, other people would comment on her name. So I just thought that so was fun. so interesting how she was able to, you know, pursue one of her or incorporate one of her other passions into finding new clients. That's a really great uh, idea. I'm glad you brought that up too, Casey, because there is a doctor, uh, an associate of mine, she lives in uh, Alaska and she's an integrative MD, but her passion is biking. She's a cyclist. So she is a member of several cycling, you know, I don't know how you cycle in Alaska for what, two months a year, but whatever. <laughs> she goes into the mountains in the winter. They make the most of it. <laughs> they make <laughs> and, and like, everybody wants to work with her as their doctor because they share, they have a common um, love, passion, mm -hmm. hobby. So think, that's a really great point that you brought up. People, if they think about what are their hobbies, is it yoga? Uh, is it, um, you know, uh, antiquing or whatever it is, art classes. There's probably, when people know that you love something that they love, there's an instant connection. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about this idea of connection mm -hmm. and association and affiliation. Affiliation is huge for people. It's a big basic human drive is affiliation with others. Well, now all of a sudden you meet them in an area of passion, like you're talking about with mm -hmm. fish, the band fish. Um, I, I'm smiling because I have a whole joke around the band fish that I won't <laughs> go into now. But <laughs> um, it's amazing how that can turn into to fast cash too, fast mm -hmm. business because people trust you. Hey, mm -hmm. she loves fish. She's got to be great. Exactly. <laughs> She's got to be good at doing mortgages because she loves fish. <laughs> <laughs> mortgages make sense to me, but people totally. don't make the bridge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a really great point. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Casey, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually, in um, regards to a lot of people being nervous, especially to do talks. So I have actually done um, talks at my gym and also at my yoga studio. 
And I just asked the owner, like, hey, would you mind if, you know, we put up like a flyer and maybe on a Saturday when there's an open slot and the space is available, I can come in and do a talk on, I've done one on like diets for athletes. And then I've also done one on non-toxic living for my little yogis. And people love it, you know, they pay like a couple of bucks and they come and I actually one time with my non-toxic class, we made um, a toilet bowl cleaner. So I brought some stuff and they could take it home with them and they loved right. it. But like, that's a really good way to also incorporate those talks, but also networking at the same time when you're nervous about doing that stuff is just finding somewhere that you would be comfortable with that group of people with doing that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. <laughs> now, okay, so... Why is connecting with your purpose so important when it comes to marketing practice? Obviously, you've got to know what your purpose is and why you're here, which will then lead you to those two things to focus on, right? And to simplify with. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and as I mentioned earlier, too, I think it really helps with that, that confidence issue that mm -hmm. so many people, um, when you're not tethered to something that is true, truly really deeply meaningful for you. Um, you know, one of the questions, you know, I, I like to ask, I believe I even ask it in the book, is sort of like, you know, at the end of your life, you know, do you, what do you want to look back and say, hey, I, I did that. I went all in. This was so important to me. We never want to be, you know, there's, there's a lot of fear that keeps people playing way smaller than they need to out there in our industry. And it's, you know, if I could wave my magic wand, that's what I'd get rid of, this confidence, this lack of confidence issue. The, the purpose really helps to address that because, you know, I know for me, if I, if I let my fear control me and basically block what's most important to me from happening, how could I live with myself? When you get, um, I've had people um, like in career development course and other courses actually write their story because it helps you get to the purpose. And when people say, well, how do I know really where the purpose is? Well, the purpose is that moment, that instant when the light bulb switched on and you went, I have got to go do this stuff. I have got to go pursue um, NTA's program. I can't imagine not doing it. What was the thing that, boom, flipped it? What was the thing that flipped that light on? Um, I, I talked with a woman once who was uh, a naturopath. And she was really interested in a particular niche market, but I could tell she wasn't terribly emotionally being pulled by it. It was just that she thought she should pursue it because she had that condition herself. She got, thought, well, I figured out how to help myself so I could help others, but she actually didn't care about that. And so I had her do some free writing um, to get to what her real purpose was. And she said that it brought her to tears when she thought of the moment. And the moment for her was both of her parents were um, conventional medical doctors. They were hospitalists, so they both worked in hospitals. And she said that she used to remember walking into hospitals um, to see her parents and the smell of the d disinfectant and those shiny floors and the beeping and the people who looked like they were being tortured laying in those <laughs> hospital rooms. And that was her moment to go into naturopathy. Mm. And from there, she realized her whole mission, her whole purpose was not about the thing she thought it was. It was about something else entirely. And so a lot of people think they know what their purpose is. But let's talk about my example. When I think about why I went into nutrition, yet yeah, all that tragedy and all that misery, that was sort of the impetus. But once I went through my nutrition program, like many people, I was faced with who should I focus my efforts on? What's my niche? Heart disease because of my brother? Or what am I interested in? Well, the answer came to me when I was walking into a grocery store one day and I was doing my grocery shopping and I saw a morbidly obese young woman, probably in her 30s, with her two very obese children. 
and they were reaching into the donut case. And I almost started to cry for the children because I thought they don't have a chance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't have a chance. And it was like a shot went right through me. So I thought that's what I'm doing. Weight management. That was it. And that's what I focused on in my um, nutrition um, services. So it, it, you'd be surprised where it might show up. It may not be the thing you think it is, but once you get there, that confidence, those issues with, oh, you know, I'm afraid to go out there. I don't know enough. All of that begins to just melt away because you have, bigger, you have a bigger purpose out there, mm -hmm. that the world needs you too badly. And you can't stand to see things go on the way if they are anymore. So it does, it does a lot, I think, for our psyches to get that connection going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool how you can specifically remember walking into the grocery store and having that aha moment. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for my moment, Miriam. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not everybody gets there that, that soon. It took me a while to get there too. It didn't happen overnight. It happened several months into my exploration. So, mm -hmm. cause yeah. I wasn't paying attention to the signs around me either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I'm like, gut stuff and then mold and then toxins and it's like it's a lot I, know, it's all, it's a lot. All I need I need to reread your book is what I need to do <laughs> you need to write your story you'll yes. get there <laughs> exactly well exactly. it's just interesting you know how many like fellow nutritional therapy practitioners you look at their Instagram or something and they have you know like 10 things listed out that they are doing you know it's like oh I help with gut health fertility, this, this, and this. And you're like, no, you can't be the expert in all of those where, you know, it's like, just really focus in on that one. But it's hard because, you know, we are so excited about everything that we've just learned in the NTA or, you know, just other things that are coming up where we're like, we just want to do all the things right now. <laughs> oh yeah. I know. Kids in candy stores are like, oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, exactly. yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty funny when you, when you put it that way, because mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard to pick and, and it is probably the biggest struggle people have is getting that figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going through the process, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the peace process. Mm -hmm. Now I know that a lot of people, especially when they graduate, they have questions on, um, do I work for myself or do I want to try to find someone to work for? Right. That is the big question. So you know, what are some of the pros and cons of working for like a clinic versus working for yourself? And then also if you kind of decided that you wanted to work for an existing clinic, how would one person go about even finding that type of work? Mm, that's, that's super question. Um, and something I'm super familiar with because that was my question to myself. And I did start out, um, probably six months after I got started, I decided to partner with an individual who was hiring and I saw her, her, um, her job posting and I went, you know, and it was in the weight management area. I said, perfect, let's go do this. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes and I learned a lot in that process. Um, first of all, in order to, to do, to seek out a partner, uh, the one, one thing that I, consistently say whether you're on your own or looking for partnership is figure out your niche with your niche ideally you can find a partner who is also interested in that same market um, and even if it's a collection of related niches or whatever it makes it easier to approach someone and say hey my focus is on people who have blood sugar management issues that is what i am going to focus on i understand you, that's what you do in your clinic here. Do you look, are you looking for someone with a uh, nutrition background to help guide these people? So niching can help powerfully help uh, uh, you if you're going to look for a partner. Um, the other thing to um, keep in mind is uh, another friend of mine who is a doctor was hiring, was looking to hire a, a nutrition expert, nutritionist in his office. And I, I asked him, I said, so he was interviewing people and he was asking me about them. I said, so what do they bring to bear? What value are they going to bring to you? And he goes, I don't know. I said, 
So is that why you're stuck and you know, don't know how to hire? He goes, yeah, because I get the feeling when they come, they're waiting for me to just hand them patients. Like, here's your office. I'll give you all the patients you need. You just sit there. You don't have to do it. He goes, I don't, that's not what I'm looking for. How will that person help the clinic overall? So if your goal is to find a partner, come equipped with your own ideas on what value you deliver beside your knowledge. Are you willing to help out with marketing? Can you contribute to their blog? Do you know how to do email marketing? Can you set up emails for them? Um, can you bring a book of clients into the business? So if I'm looking at two potential candidates for a job, but candidate A is looking for me to just hand off clients to her versus client or candidate B who says, oh, well, I'm an expert in social media marketing. I can run your social media. It's like, boom, you got the job. Mm -hmm. So the value, you bring value beyond just your nutrition understanding. We all do. Maybe you can help with managing business or supplement managing the inventory of supplements, whatever it is. Think about other value that you bring. Um, the pros and cons, you know, the pros of, let's say, starting out with a partner, obviously, if you're newly uh, credentialed from your, your school, um, it's a way to be mentored to some extent, to learn the process of working with clients, the flow, the paperwork, the bookkeeping, how to speak to them, uh, how to uh, develop therapies, that sort of thing. So you get a lot of great um, sort of uh, onboarding in your actual practice. Mm -hmm. And that can be very, very helpful. Um, there's less um, sort of demand on you to go out and market yourself. Although personally, I think everybody, no matter whether you work for yourself or for somebody else, we're all in the marketing game. Um, we're all selling our services uh, wide and far. We have to because we got a lot of people out there who are getting the wrong information and it's our job um, to be evangelists for this work. So, um, so anyway, that's, you don't necessarily have responsibility for marketing. So that takes some of the burden off of you. Um, you know, it's, it maybe just a lot of people just like to have a job to go to. They just feel more comfortable in that kind of a setup. You know, the downsides are you are not in control of your own ship. You're basically going to follow the methods and processes of another person. Um, you're probably going to be limited, more limited on what they'll pay you because the market can only bear so much for nutrition consulting. So if that partner, let's say it's a naturopath, uh, will charge, you know, $100 for your services, well, the naturopath's going to keep a big bulk of that. So you're going to get paid less. But frankly, you should be because you're not doing anything to market and bring that person in. So mm -hmm. that's sort of a way to think about it. The area I, I caution people about, um, and of course, just, you know, naming your own business, uh, creating the programs you want, writing your own blog. Some people get very thrilled by it, that ownership. I, that's who I was. I wanted total control. I didn't want any more bosses in my life telling me what to do. But the downside, uh, another downside or something to consider, let's put it that way. If you want to work with a partner, be very mindful of getting a contract. And this is where I've been bit and many associates of mine have been bitten too in that without a contract, things like who's responsible for what, what are the termination agreement, uh, steer as far away as possible from anything called profit sharing. If somebody says, look, I can't pay you, but I'll, let, I'll give you a share of profits. No, just say no, run as fast as possible. And this is where I got burned. This is the problem. Unless you have a say so, in how that business is spending their money. How do you know what the profit is going to be? And so the person I was working with uh, wanted to do a profit sharing arrangement with me. I agreed to at first. And then I started to notice crazy things on the, the P&L, the balance sheet, where she was, her car was being paid for by the business. 
her plastic surgery was being paid for by the business because she was the face of the business and she had to look good. So there was no profit. She spent it all. Mm -hmm. And I had no control over that. So profit sharing, bad plan, unless you are part owner and you have some control over how the monies are brought in and, and where they go. So um, there are a lot of, lot of um, good, bad, and ugly stories when it comes to partnerships. Just make sure your eyes are wide open. You negotiate uh, what you feel is a fair rate. Uh, understand all the responsibilities are expected of you. Um, and um, just, just be very mindful to protect your own interests in any kind of partnership because, frankly, they're not really looking out for your interests. They're looking out for their own. Mm -hmm. So that's Get everything it. in writing. Everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everything. <laughs> Those are some good tips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy that. I have the uh, blessing to work for a functional MD, but also obviously for myself. And so I see like both sides of everything, which has been a really cool experience, but definitely covering your booty when you're working with someone else is really important. And being really, really concrete about their expectations of you and what your responsibilities are gonna be is also really important. So. Yeah, and, and I met that MD you work for and she seems like she's full of integrity. And that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that you cannot always um, assume. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You are very lucky. She's a wonderful woman. Yes. Dr. Ginsburg is amazing. Um, Sheila's been on the show. We're actually going to have Dr. Ginsburg on the show soon to talk about her new book that she's writing or awesome. is finishing up now. Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. I got really lucky. But just from my experience of working for another practitioner. Yeah. Just cover all the bases, you know, make sure. Um, we did a really good job with that. So I've been pleased, but also just working out all the funny details that people don't really like to talk about, like your yeah. pay and you know what you're going to be expected to do and all these things. It's yeah. important. It's, it's really important. important. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> so funny. I forgot you had met her. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's amazing now. Okay. So here's another one for you. And, um, just how do you suggest that people, especially when they're first getting started, um, how do you suggest that they get over their fears with starting a new practice and just jump into it? <laughs> a lot of people, especially are scared, of course, like of the camera, right? Like doing like video recordings and those kinds of things. I know that was a big one for me. Yeah. So obviously it's just one day at a time, one set at a time and just start doing it. But what are your, some of your best suggestions? Well, <laughs> um, Take the first step, even though you're terrified. And, and, you know, I don't know how many times you can say that to somebody because there's, there's very little besides saying, just take the first step. Knowing that the safety net is there, nobody's going to die. <laughs> you, you might make a mistake, but guess what? There isn't one human being out there from the most uh, unsuccessful to the multi-billionaires out there who haven't made mistakes, especially early on. Because you don't know what you don't know yet. But you can't know what you don't know until you take the first step. So mm -hmm. take the step. Um, the fear is, I don't know enough. Okay, these are the common fears I hear. I don't know enough yet. Guess what? You do. You don't have to know it all. You just have to know more than your client. And guess what? You do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. have faith. You spent nine months minimum learning this stuff. Like I say, most of us have been reading books well before that. You know enough. You know enough to help, help somebody with minor tweaks to their diet that could make major improvements in how they feel. We all know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs more than that. They're not looking for all the minutia and technical aspects of nutritional therapy. They just want to feel a little better. You can do this. Mm -hmm. Take one small step. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I had another thought on that one. So the other, the other fear I hear a lot of is this imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, who am I to work in weight management? I'm still overweight. How can I help somebody with weight management when I'm fat? Well, my guess is 
you're still better than you were before you knew about nutritional therapy. You, of all people, know how to guide people who struggle with this problem because you are that person. Hmm. In fact, many people would rather come to somebody who knows personally, firsthand, the trials and tribula tribulations, the fact that I'm not perfect yet, but I'm way better than I was six months ago, a year ago. So the imposter syndrome, like, oh my gosh, I'm not perfect yet, how can I help other people? Throw that aside, there is no perfection. None of us are perfect health-wise. I don't know of anybody in, in our society today that doesn't have some health condition, some health issue. Stop chasing perfection, it's a myth. It's, it's like, um, you know, uh, chasing the, um, the horizon. You know, you keep thinking, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally get there. Mm -hmm. Guess what? <laughs> it keeps moving, mm -hmm. just like perfection. Mm -hmm. So some of that is sort of taking a, a, a good look at not where you are, but where you are relative to where you were. You're good enough. You know, don't let the imposter syndrome stop you. Um, do the scary stuff first. So, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a list maker. I've got lists for my personal life and my professional life and this thing and that thing. I got 15 lists all over the house. And what do we typically do with those lists? We do the easy stuff first, right? Because we, I love those check marks. Got it done. But guess what? Focus on the hard stuff. Because if you can do the hard or the scary stuff first, the rest of it's a breeze, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like tackle the things that terrify you most to prove to yourself you can do this. And that might give you enough confidence to take the next step and the next step. And before you know it, you're saying to yourself, why was I so afraid of this? Mm -hmm. This is nothing. Easy, okay? Um, of course, take the career development course if you're a uh, <laughs> either an NTA graduate or uh, NANP members. We're going to be opening it up to them too pretty soon. Cool. Um, awesome. Because we talk a lot about this stuff. All of this stuff that I've been, um, the whole course is based on my book, mm -hmm. but we've added so much more. Jessica Ponner Meal, uh, who's co teaches with me, uh, she's added a ton on digital marketing and how to work with clients and all kinds of great stuff, what business structure to set up. Mm -hmm. uh, so look, if it's not this course, some course that will also help you work through some of these fears and confidence issues. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for being on the show. I have learned so much from you all over again, just like <laughs> I did during the course. And I know our listeners are going to get so much value out of this podcast as well. Now, where's the best place for people to find you? Um, you mean physically? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, your address, please. Right. And <laughs> yeah, here's my phone number and all my info. Exactly. Um, uh, MiriamZacharias.com. Okay, perfect. Probably the and best way. Yeah. We'll have that all linked up in the show notes along with a link to your book because I think that everybody who is – yeah, everybody just needs to read this book. <laughs> fabulous. Thank you well, so much. Well, thank you again for being a guest on the show. We so enjoyed your chat Bye. and all of the information you shared. Well, gratitude to you too as well for all that you do for these people. It's amazing, the content that you were providing. We need more people like you out there bringing mm. this information out to our community. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk business because I could talk about it all day. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Marianne. This has been super fun. Thank you.